what did we talk about last time? Oops. Oh, also, yeah. Um, so homework was due last night, right? And this is the, the last homework should be coming out soon. What's the, Brian, what are we, how are we looking on that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can make it Friday, right? We'll give you guys two weeks, Friday or whatever on it. Um, and then, yeah, we should talk about logistics for like the class project presentation stuff too at some point. Uh, we can punt on that for now. Just of it is we're going to use the last, probably the last two classes. So the last week of class to do sort of lightning talk presentations, basically. So it'd be like five minutes ish per group. And you do like a little lightning talk. You do not have to have the write up done until the end of finals week, basically. I will uh, give you a final deadline on that when it gets closer. I'm basically going to just back up two or three days from when I have to submit grades, which is the very, very end of finals. So I will give you guys as much time as I can, basically, um, to get the final reports. And we talked about this, right? So the final reports are going to be like in the style of like an ICRA conference paper or something like this. So it's a like six page, two column you know, format, the usual deal. Um, cool, yeah, any other questions about any of that stuff? Okay, all right, let's do it. So last time we talked about um, kind of finishing up the LQG story and the Kalman filter half of that story. And then we did um, the, uh, uh, we, so we did the whole LQG controller all together with the column filter hooked up to the LQR controller. And then we um, talked at the end a bit about this idea of duality between control and estimation and how you can write down uh, the state estimation problem as an equivalent optimal control problem. And uh, sort of, you know, they're, they're very closely related things. And that's a cool, generally an interesting topic to talk about. Like there's a lot more to that if you're into it, I kind of recommend checking it out. Uh, okay, so today I'm gonna talk about sort of another weirdo direction to go off of the classic um, kind of deterministic, uh, assume we know everything, uh, optimal control setup. Today, we're gonna talk a bit about robust control. Which is a whole field, uh, and you could, you know, do a whole class on. So we're going to give like only the very kind of briefest of overviews on this, similar to the estimation story we did last time. And in particular, we're going to talk about one algorithm that slots nicely into our conversation about other things that we've done so far, which is called uh, Minimax DDP. So it's a kind of extension of DDP to the robust case. This paper is actually from our own Chris Atkinson, who from a little while ago, which is. Sorry, was there? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, cool. So I guess we'll start out with like a little bit of uh, backstory and history here. So context. So the first thing to say is, right, so last time we talked about stochastic optimal control and like the LQG story and stochastic methods assume that you have randomness in the system, like random noise on your inputs and observations and things like this, right? So this robustness is a different thing. Robustness is not about noise. That's the first thing to say. Um, and the other thing that's really common in this stochastic setting that we talked about last time, even in more general context, is to assume that these noise is zero mean or unbiased in some way. So a lot of those, those LQG things, a lot of similar methods, they assume, you know, if there's noise, they still assume that it's like unbiased zero mean kind of noise, such that, you know, if there is a disturbance over, you know, some time, it kind of averages out to zero. So even if it's banging you around, it's not like pushing you way to one, one direction or biasing things.
And that turns out to be kind of a big assumption. Um, in particular, that like those LQG assumptions of like zero mean noise are a really bad model for parametric uncertainties or unmodeled dynamics, right? So you can imagine I can make things, you know, with LQG, I can make them tolerate actually really large noise, right? So think about the wind gust example again on the quad rotor. Uh, that's not going to kill my controller, right? Like if I have gusts blowing around left, right, I'm going to wiggle around a bunch, but I'll still kind of, whereas if I had a parametric uncertainty, so let's say I had like, uh, you know, the mass wrong, um, that's going to have a big effect. If I had like the gains between my left and right side propellers wrong or something like this, it's going to make me potentially like fly sideways and crash and do really badly, right? So those kind of parametric uncertainties can be, um, the LQG is not robust to those things inherently. So that's the first comment. Um, then the, the other stuff we talked about here previously um, for dealing with like this kind of parametric uncertainty, you know, case would be, uh, or unmodeled dynamics, right? So we're saying LQG is bad at parametric uncertainty on model dynamics. We talked about another class of sort of algorithms previously that, that does deal with those. And that was ILC, right? The iterative learning control stuff. So that's great at dealing with parametric uncertainty or unmodeled dynamics. You just do a handful of rollouts and you kind of dial things in. And let's see, so that, that's sort of a different category. So ILC would kind of, I would call, uh, I would place in the general category of adaptive controls. The idea is there is there's some system you don't completely understand. You're gonna go do some stuff on the system to try to better understand it, right? And kind of fix the things you don't understand to achieve high performance, right? Over, over some trials or whatever by interacting. Um, so that's kind of adaptive control. So the idea is, you know, try to learn or adapt to the unknown model parameters. Generally online is what adaptive control is all about. You could argue ILC is more of an offline thing. You could use it online as well, but that's kind of the gist. Um, so you're trying to online figure out what the unknown stuff is in some way to achieve optimal performance. In some sense, whatever optimal is in this particular context, right? So the, that's kind of the ILC adaptive thing. Um, so robust control is a completely different idea from either of these. So it's not dealing with noise. And it's not trying to learn parameters and adapt online. Instead, it's a very conservative offline thing. The idea with robust control is that what you're trying to do at the end of the day is say, I don't know everything about the system. I think I can kind of bound what I don't know, though, or estimate the, the range of uncertainty. And offline, I want to do a bunch of control design work to design a single control policy that's guaranteed to work, to stabilize the system, to not face plant, et cetera over any model that could happen, you know, that could show up that it could be faced with online, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So you don't adapt, it's a fixed control policy and um, you're not assuming noise. It can be parametric, whatever. If you're assuming that like you have, you, you, you could have any system from some set and you want one controller that could work over all those systems. Let's see, anything else to say about this? So inherently, uh, like the big idea here is when you do that, you're pretty much always giving up some performance in exchange for that robustness, right? So we say robustness, we mean that the controller is still gonna work 
even if the model, the true dynamics, whatever, are, are quite different from what you know we expect, maybe. Um, but you're never gonna you're you're trading like you're not exploiting all of the hardware capabilities or knowledge of the dynamics in that case, right? You're backing off a little bit on performance. So try to design a controller. offline that will still work on a range of different possible models. So yeah, and then Generally, you're sacrificing some performance for these kind of safety slash robustness uh, guarantees. And, and typically, this whole robustness game is about guaranteeing that things are going to be stable, et cetera, under these sort of bounds on the uncertainty and stuff like this. Um, so historically, where this stuff came from, um, I'll show you the, the paper, which is kind of awesome. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, early work on LQR, when after LQR was invented in the late 60s, people looked at these kind of robustness questions for linear systems with LQR, and they found that um, LQR actually has quite good robustness. It turns out LQR is somewhat naturally robust to uncertainty in like your A and B matrices, which is kind of cool. So people thought that it was sort of naturally robust and we didn't really have to worry about this stuff. Um, but then kind of a little bit later, it was discovered that LQG with the Coleman filter plus the LQR controller hooked together, like we talked about last time, turns out LQG is not robust, it is the opposite of robust. And you can make systems that basically arbitrarily small, like infinitesimal perturbations in like the ABC matrices will lead to that thing barfing and, and going unstable for extremely small perturbations. So the, the paper, which I think I talked about at one point, this is a total classic in the history of control. Uh, John Doyle, guaranteed margins for LQG regulators, abstract, there are none. Amazing, so good, so classic. Um, so yeah, and basically the paper, it's a two page note and he just points out like a, this little counter example. It's like, here's this random system, super simple linear system and like shows that for the tiniest little perturbation, the closed loop system will go unstable. I think it's not even a full page in the two columns. It's like a column and a half. It's kind of insane. So, but yeah, this thing's super famous. I think he was a grad student when we did this too. It's like his first like paper and that was it. It's, and it's, you know. Epic. Anyway, total classic. So he, he did this in the 70s, late 70s, I think. And literally that paper, just pointing that out, spawned an entire field of robust control. And this was like really hot in the, in the 80s into the 90s, uh, linear robust control theory. So basically people developed methods to design uh, robust closed loop controllers such that you could guarantee, you know, things uh, not going unstable under these kind of perturbations. So that's kind of the backstory. So Um, yeah, cool. I think that's about all there's to say about this. Okay, so any questions about that stuff?
that's the backstory. So then, yeah, basically for, I don't know, 20 years or so. Yeah. Uh, it's subtle. <laughs> it's basically the fact that like, um, I don't know if there's a good intuitive explanation for this. It's kind of, it has to do with the fact that you have partial state observations and like the estimator can fail at reconstructing the state and therefore really like inherently, right? If we, we kind of argue that LQR is super robust on its own, if you have full state feedback, the problem is really with the estimator, right? I think is a, a good way to say it. Oh yeah. I mean, this, the linear case is the most benign case, right? So like a Kalman filter on a linear system is bad. It's kind of the, so like EKFs on nonlinear systems can be really bad and um, are very hard to tune actually in practice. I don't know if you've done this, but. It is, yeah. That has nothing to do with this robustness thing though. Yeah, yeah, so this is a complete, like, so give me a linear system and like, yeah, the Kalman filter is the optimal thing to do as in it will give you the best state estimate you can have on that linear system. But if you give me a linear system that has like 10% uncertainty in the A and B matrices, depending on how you perturb those things, uh, you can like construct adversarial examples of linear system matrices such that the Kalman filter will totally barf. Um, yeah, so that's that's life, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So is that true for the Kalman filter on its own? Like just yes. On like yeah, yeah. System? Yeah, I think, I think so. Like, yeah, you can do quite badly. Um, and I think like what this is getting at is it in some sense like that problem's harder. You can imagine like I could have a big state with like a you know short fat C matrix such that I have really sparse observations so that such a reconstructing the state is quite a hard problem right from from those measurements and like if you have a bad model and you have very sparse measurements and you're relying on the model to sort of fill in the gaps between what your sensors are giving you and the full state that's kind of a hard problem right you could argue the dual would be of like you know <laughs> problem with only like one or two control inputs with a big state vector that you have to stabilize. But I don't know, yeah, like it's, it seems like the filtering problem is somewhat harder, I guess. Anyway, okay, any other questions on this? All right, so let's uh, dig into, so we're gonna define a robust control problem. There's a lot of ways of doing this. This is kind of, I would say, pretty much, uh, this is a, a pretty broad definition that I think covers most of the, the versions of this. So what we're gonna do is assume a system that looks like the following. So we've got our usual uh, F of X, U, now we're gonna add a third input that we're gonna call W. And this is the, we're gonna call this W the disturbance. So unlike in the Kalman filter that we talked about last time, there, right, we had W showing up as this additive Gaussian noise, zero mean, blah, blah, blah. We had all these assumptions on W, right? It was added on on the outside and had all these statistical properties. Here, we're not making any assumptions. W could be a fixed vector. That's like just, you know, a number um, for all, all time. It could be noisy, it could bounce around, it can do anything, right? So we're not saying anything about the statistics in this case. Um, it could represent parametric uncertainty, right? Like this could be tweaking the masses and lengths of the robot model, right? It could show up in any way inside the model. So this is super general. Uh, constant parameter offsets. This could be time varying or uh, non smooth stuff. Could be bounds on. Uh, uh, the prediction error of your model kind of thing. Like you could basically say, I have a nominal model, you know, if you can bound the prediction error, 
uh, you know, for, for say some learned model, say you could kind of throw that in there. So literally anything. And then the typical move here is to assume some bounds on the Ws. And like, there's a, a whole bunch of options here. You can assume W is drawn from some set. You can assume the norm is bounded. Um, and usually these bounds or whatever or restrictions are chosen for mathematical convenience in the theory, but that's kind of the general idea. So, I mean, and kind of in some sense, you have to do something like this to, to get anywhere, right? Like at the end of the day, if this can be arbitrarily huge, then what good is the model to begin with, right? So what you're kind of arguing here is I have some model, it's mostly right, but it has some chunk that I don't know well. But you know, if W is too huge, then basically there's no predictive power in that model, right? So you, you say, okay, this thing's gotta be bounded somehow. And now the optimal control problem looks like this. So we're gonna minimize as, as usual with respect to the X's and the U's. And then we're gonna maximize with respect to the W's. So what we're saying is I wanna find the controller that does the best under the worst case possible W um, of my cost function. Subject to those dynamics. And then you can have, you know, the usual stuff, constraints on the states, constraints on the controls and constraints on the Ws. So this would be, you know, saying here, you would, this is where you would put in that, you know, the bounds on the W, what the set that it's drawn from whatever, right? Okay, so what kind of problem is this now from an optimization standpoint? Minimax. Yeah, it's a mini, it's mini max or also known as the, the, the local optimum we're trying to find is not a minimum anymore. What is it? That's the saddle point, right? Yeah. Um, cool. This is called a minimax optimization problem. Uh, has anyone seen one of these before? Yes. Where have you seen these before? Yeah. In what context? Huh? Oh yeah, that's like basically this idea, but in you know machine learning land, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the GAN idea is literally like this, basically, right? Just with lots of different language and you know stochastic everything or whatever. Yeah. So I think in the GAN case, you put the order of next contains the constant change of It does. Yeah, yeah. In this case, is there any like a Depends. So what do you think? Try to answer that with a question. 
So there's a case in which it doesn't matter, which is very special. Thoughts on that? So it turns out in the linear case, it doesn't matter. And you can switch. But basically, in any nonlinear context, you can't switch them. As in, like an LQR type problem. Like if, every, if you know, linear dynamics, quadratic cost, et cetera, there's some cases where you can flip. And basically, that corresponds to things that are sort of convex in XU and concave in W already. Right. So that basically, where there's already, a, you know, there's only a single local optimum, and it doesn't matter. There's only, basically, then in that case, there's only one saddle point. Right. So it doesn't matter what order you do. But in, in the more general ca case, you can't flip the order. Yeah. Um, and this is like actually going back to like straight up convex optimization, right? Strong convexity is like you can flip the order, right? Of, of the min and the max over the, the x's and the lambdas. So it's that kind of idea, right? So in, in the sort of like robust linear control case, you can you can flip and it's okay, but usually you can't. <laughs> yeah. Is this related to min max and min max degrees? Yeah, that's actually what I was just about to say. So this is actually equivalent to a two-player game, right? So you can imagine, right, like, as, as I wrote this right here, W looks like another control input, right? So I've got a U control input and a W control input, and I have, like, this one system with one state. You can interpret this as a two-player game where there's a U player who's trying to minimize the cost and a W player who's trying to maximize the cost at every turn, right? And then what you find if you solve this problem, the saddle point, is like the equilibrium in the game theoretic sense between the two players, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So W is the disturbance, right? It's like the bad thing. And if I want this system to be as robust as possible to disturb it, to like, you know, disturbance forces, model error, et cetera, I want to be able to tolerate the biggest disturbance, right? The bigger the disturbance that I can successfully, you know, still stabilize, still work, the more robust the controller is, right? So like um, also in general, right? Like, so here I'm saying, you know, like W's from some set, right? And I'm saying, you know, usually we put a norm in there or something like this. The bigger I make that, you know, allow W to be, the harder this problem is to solve, right? And at a certain point, it might not be feasible anymore. Like I might not be able to find a controller that can stabilize that thing with a huge possible disturbance, right? So there's this inherent trade-off. There's basically always a trade-off between robustness and performance, right? So here I'm saying, if I make W really big, I'm gonna have a way higher cost, right? And I'm gonna do worse in general. Um, but the, the idea is you're trading performance for robustness. The bigger you can make the W here, the more you'll be able to like tolerate and not fail, right? With your controller, yeah. Is this the same stuff that like when people say H2 like So H2 is actually standard LQR stuff. H infinity is the robust stuff. And this is exactly, so H infinity corresponds to a particular choice of set on W here in this problem. And then trying to optimize uh, like a linear feedback gain matrix a la LQR. So in the, yeah, basically in the linear quadratic case with a particular choice of W set, that's what at H infinity control is. Yeah, that makes sense? Yeah. yeah. So this is like kind of the general setup. And yeah, for specific choices in here, you can derive H infinity things. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were trying to expect the theoretic between performance and production. Mm -hmm. So by transferring this um, value um, in our function, by using performance, do you mean we kind of don't reach the best uh, SMU if we did, uh, if we have not transferred it? Yeah, basically, if there is no W in here, if it's no disturbance, then I have like the optimal thing, right? By sticking this W in here and saying you still have to work even with this, you know, adversarial setup where someone's fighting you, you're going to not do as well as if you didn't have the, I mean, it's kind of common sense, right? Yeah, but um, say you um, do a standard solution using the max and in actuality, W is stable. Yeah. Then we can still reach the problem if we didn't have it. No. Yeah. So like what here, we're designing a controller with a like such that you can tolerate some W, right? The controller you get with that, you know, sort of consider this adversarial W thing 
is qualitatively different than the nominal controller would have been with no W. And in general, even if there's zero W when you go run it online, it's gonna have a higher cost because you designed it from the outset to tolerate the W. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So, yeah. Um, there is going to be like one W of the maximum that we should write. So you're kind of designing it for that one. Maximum. So not really actually. So this is time varying, right? Okay. And so like W can change per time step. And so at a different time step, like different choices of W can be worse or better, right? So what this is doing is along the whole trajectory, it's saying, find me the worst W drawn from that set of possible Ws at every single time step. So like, like an example of this might be like, if I had an uncertain mass in like my card pole or something, right? Um, when it's like, I don't know, some, at some point in the trajectory, like having a lighter mass is probably you know, going to mess you up worse. At some other points in the trajectory, having a heavier mass probably going to mess you up worse, right? In the real system, that mass is fixed for the whole tra trajectory, right? Even if it's uncertain, there is a mass, you know, you might not know it. Here, if I go optimize this, it's going to find a time varying mass over the whole trajectory that like makes the cost function the highest. But the idea is that that's the worst possible thing. And so whatever the mass actually is, uh, you know, assuming it's fixed to the whole thing, like the controller can can deal with that because it's going to be strictly not as bad as this weirdo worst case time varying mass that you solve for with this problem. Yeah, but isn't it, isn't it going to like overcorrect then if it is actually not as bad as the maximum? So like the idea here is you're you're also finding. So the other thing about the robust thing, this I wrote this down as an open loop trajectory, you know, thing. But generally speaking, you're you're solving for a feedback policy here. So that feedback policy, like online, you got feedback, you'll like, but the idea is if you do this and optimize a feedback policy, that feedback policy will still successfully stabilize, et cetera, for anything, any W that you pick from that set is what this is trying to do. Yeah, usually a lot of this is about finding optimal feedback policies that are robust like this. And most of the theory, like most theory things is for linear systems. And that's this H infinity optimal control stuff. This was basically the 80s and 90s of control theory were all about this. This was like the big topic. Um, okay, so let me write some of this down. I just said all of this stuff out loud as you guys asked me the questions. Uh, so now, now I get to write it down, I guess. Um, yeah, so this is kind of cool. This has deep connections to game theory. This is a, uh, it's actually a Stackelberg game, if anyone knows what that is. Uh, where does I say, where are they? You have a U player um, and W player. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so there's that. And then the other thing to say about this is, you know, in general, these problems are really hard to solve. They're like strictly more difficult than, you know, the original optimal control problem. Uh, for linear systems, we can solve them most of the time. <laughs> There's a whole theory. From the 80s to 90s. Um, and yeah, usually we talk about this as H infinity control. Um, that's basically a generalization of LQG to this robust problem.
And it's like at this point, well established. It's basically like a solved thing. And there, to the extent that there's a MATLAB toolbox for it. So if there's a MATLAB toolbox, you know, it's not, it's not really a, a research area anymore, I would say. <laughs> Um, yeah, and this stuff, I mean, it, it is actually kind of powerful, right? So one of the big ideas there is if that W can be anything, um, one of the things this lets you do is use, like if you have a linear model for a nonlinear system, um, it lets you use that linear model, bound the error on the linearization between the linear system, you know, linearized system and the true nonlinear system, and use this stuff to kind of guarantee that your linear controller will work on the nonlinear system within some range, right? So it's kind of a powerful thing uh, and like lets you get some guarantees and still use linear control design techniques. So that. Okay, so that's kind of the whole like big picture story. Um, if you're interested and want to do this stuff, you know, uh, on a linear system, there's this whole H infinity thing. There's books about it. There's a MATLAB toolbox. We're not really going to spend any time on it, but it's the gist of it is solving that LQR problem with the disturbance with bounds on it. Um, what we are going to do is this thing that um, it's from the early 2000s from Chris Hackinson called Minimax DDP. And it's basically extending DDP to this problem, right? So we, we get, and then in this case, right, we're going to get both a nominal trajectory and a robust linear tracking controller, right, for that system out of doing this. So that's kind of cool, um, kind of interesting. So the idea is we're going to use a local linear sort of slash quadratic Taylor expansion to iteratively find a local optimum. Okay, so it looks a lot like DDP. I'm, I'm basically going to focus on the new parts since we've already done a lot of DDP stuff in here. I'm going to show you where all the tweaks are and like what the differences are and try to avoid doing all of the messy math again for the stuff that we've already seen. So here we go. So first thing is we expand the dynamics. So we have, in general, something like X plus Delta X, you know, U plus Delta U, and now also the W. And this is a nominal value plus, we're gonna have like A Delta X, B Delta U, and we'll call this thing D, I guess, because C is already the observation thing. So that's the dynamics expansion. We basically get a new, you know, a new Jacobian matrix thing for the disturbance. And then the next thing to do is expand the, uh, the action value function. So we're gonna expand the Q function, gradient and Hessian like before. We're just gonna get these new W terms. Um, I'm gonna call that action value function G again instead of Q, which is annoying, sorry. Okay, so this thing looks like, or what is that? Yeah, we're gonna call this S and then the, the gradient and Hessian are gonna be G matrices. So same deal, this thing's a function of now, it was originally X and U and now it's also a function of W. And the gradient uh, is gonna be, so X, U, W, Here's the gradient term. We're going to have GX, GU, Q, 
GW times the deltas. Then we're going to get a Hessian term down here. So this thing is We're just going to label the blocks. None of this is surprising. So essentially, you add all these W's in and turn the crank on this just like you would have for the original DDP. And you'll get a few extra things in the feedback gains and stuff. So we'll. Hopefully, try to get at this in the least painful way possible. Okay, so there's that. Now we do the Bellman backup thing. So the action, the, the value function cost to go function thing, still a function of just the state. So we got this just the state and unexpectedly we're going to minimize over delta u and maximize over delta w right so this gives it even more the flavor of like this two player game thing right it's like we have two control inputs a, a u and a w from two players and they're fighting each other right so min over delta u max over delta w and i guess i'll write this thing out Um, the whole expansion. Which is annoying and terrible. I don't know how. Uh, then what else? Okay. Did I get them all? I think I got them all. Okay, that's the whole thing. So now uh, we're gonna take this exactly the same as in the standard case we did before. We're going to take the partial derivatives with respect to u and x and set them equal to zero, right? So let's do that. I guess partial this thing with respect to u. So if I set the partial uh, with respect to u equal to zero, I get the following thing. And I do the same thing again, the W. Okay, cool. So the, the main sort of takeaway at this point is what we're trying to do, right, is we're ultimately trying to find a feedback gain um, and a few for a correction. What you see here, unsurprisingly, is that the U's and the W's are coupled. So like what the U does depends on what the W does and vice versa, right? So, um, oh yeah, there's one other thing to point out here. In this first order necessary condition stuff I just wrote down, right, gradient equals zero. Is there anything in there to tell me if this is a min or a max? Goes back to like the first week of class. Huh? Yeah, we got to remember the definite is stuff on the Hessian. Right? So the um, so we we want to min, be minimizing over delta u. So therefore, guu the Hessian respect to u needs to be positive definite. We want to maximize over w. To be maximizing, I need the opposite. I need the gww Hessian to be negative definite, right? All negative eigenvalues. So that's kind of so unsurprisingly, like in that sort of in the standard way, just like we talked about with KKT systems, which are also saddle points, 
we might have to regularize these things, right? To get them to do the right thing on a nonlinear problem. So G U U positive definite, G W W negative definite. Uh, okay, so if I go and solve, so I can go and solve these, right? Each for for the other thing, if I want to. So the gist of how you you make the next move here is, I'm going to solve for one in terms of the other and plug them into each other to eliminate, and get the feedback gain. So like if I for example, I can take the first equation and solve it for delta u and then plug that into the second one to eliminate all the u's and vice versa. I can put, solve the second one for delta w, plug it into the first one and get, um, get just the u's, right? So I can eliminate them that way. So if I do that, I get, you know, this kind of thing. And this thing right for the other one. Now I plug these into, yeah. We do that. I'm going to probably, I will write this out once on the next page for the sole reason that I want to show you. Basically, it looks like LQR plus the, some extra terms that are kind of the robustifying terms. And so that's what this looks like. Let's see. So if I do that whole mess, I'm going to get something that looks like this delta u equals, um, like we had before, we get a feed forward term and a feedback term. And you get, D that looks like the following thing. Let me write this. D is uh, I can't read my own handwriting now, which is terrible. <laughs> okay, so that, and then we get a K matrix that looks like this. Okay, so here's what's going on. There's, uh, so these, the things uh, in green are original LQR stuff. And the things in red are new things that came from the, the W stuff, the robust stuff. Cool. So yeah, so you can think about this as like, it's robustifying the LQR policy. It's tweaking both the feed forward stuff. So you're getting a different trajectory, a different nominal trajectory than you would have before. And it's also tweaking the feedback gain. So you're getting a different feedback policy than you would have before also. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of terrible. Sorry. Um, the best move, honestly, is probably for you to just go get it out of the paper, which I will show you. <laughs> Um, apologies for your terrible, like, are you guys actually writing down all of my terrible scribbles? Because you really shouldn't be. <laughs> That's why I give you the notes. So you don't have to sit here and write down my terrible scribbles. And then also I will send you this. So this is the original paper. 
um, on this algorithm where you can find it, you know, written out with Q's instead of S's, like, you know, maybe you like. And, uh, and yeah, here, it's all here. This is fine. You can look at this. This is better. Don't write my scribbles down. Um, so yeah, these guys, I mean, so, so this was from like now almost 20 years ago, which is insane to think about. Um, but yeah, they, uh, kind of the original application was, they did this on a, a legged robot and tried to optimize it to be robust to, you know, parameter errors and walk uh, while not face planting. And so that you, you know, the, the punchline is they've done some hand tuned PD stuff. They did some DDP stuff. It fell over. And then this minimax setup could walk a lot farther before it face planted because it was robust. Kind of cool. That was a long time ago. But yeah, I'll send you guys this paper on the, I'll post it. Yeah. So why do you not use the same thing with index? Sorry, can you explain what you mean? Like when you think of the whole DDP formulation, it essentially just processed from DU and DX, right? Well, we we minimized only over the use. Right, so like the whole thing, we, we're doing dynamic programming, right? So you, you're solving for this value function thing. Mm -hmm. At each sort of backup step, you've got this action value thing. It's a function of X and U, right? And you minimize it over the U's so that you get just a function of X, the value function. Yeah. Then you go back another time step, plug in the dynamics, the one step cost, and now you get a function over X and U again, minimize over U, back up again. So you're always minimizing over U, right? In the standard flavored version. And you're maintaining this like, value function, cost to go function thing over the states. Mm -hmm. Here, same kind of thing, um, but I think the two player game interpretation is really nice here. So you're still getting a value function over the states, but you're getting basically two feedback policies and you're optimizing over two different inputs, right? Corresponding to these two players at each backup step now, which gives it this two player game flavor, right? And that's kind of the way to think about it. Uh, it's sort of this adversarial you know, thing where you, you assume that you have like an adversarial player choosing the worst possible disturbance at every time step, right? And then the, the control player, the U player has to deal with that, right? And that's actually part of the min-max thing. Um, the min-max here, to go back to your question, has to do with the ordering of the players. So here, basically like the W player gets to move, make the first move. And then the U player has to respond to that move, right? That's sort of, um, did I do that right? Yeah, the max is inside. The max goes first, the W goes first, yeah. Is this Yes, it's a Stackelberg game. That's exactly right. So it has that inherent ordering, right? Whereas in a Nash game, it wouldn't have the ordering necessarily, right? So the Nash problem looks actually a bit different. The first order necessary conditions for Nash equilibrium look different because there's symmetry between the players, right? Here, there's an asymmetry, like one player goes first and then the other player responds, which is Stackelberg. Yeah. Yep. Can you flip the order and say for a minimum uh, input, what's the maximum W? You could do that, yeah, but you would get a different answer in general. In a linear, in the linear quadratic case, I think the solution ends up being the same. But in this DDP setup, it wouldn't be the same, right? Because this is like we're doing Newton on the nonlinear thing. But yeah, I think for a linear game, it, it does end up being the same. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, outside of like control for like moving things, can you use this in like um, design optimization where you're trying to like minimize mass, maximize like stiffness for a part or something like that? Um, um, so in general, like you could write that optimization problem down and it would be a mini max optimization problem for sure. Uh, it wouldn't have, so the, the special thing here is this like dynamic programming flavor, uh, like that comes from that control problem structure, like the time sort of structure of it, right? Where you can do dynamic programming through time, right? On the, like the Bellman thing. So in that structure optimization problem, if you're just optimizing a static thing right there's no notion of time there's no notion of trajectory there's no dynamics really right these are just like there's some cost function you know that has a mass and a stiffness and you want to do the best you can so yeah you can absolutely write it down as a mini max optimization problem go solve it it um it doesn't have like the same structure as this necessarily so like you know like you don't have a feedback policy there anywhere right there's no trajectory stuff but yeah in principle like some of this carries over yeah like the mini max flavor carries over for sure and part of that is like, um, these are weird problems, I guess, at one level. Like, uh, so minimax problems are not kind of standard optimization problems in a lot of ways. And you kind of can't use kind of stock off the shelf optimization solvers to solve these problems either because of this saddle point minimax flavor. Like I can't go use like IP opt on this problem, right? 
because those are finding minimizers always. They're designed to minimize, right? And this has some weird stuff going on that a bunch of the assumptions baked into IPOPT uh, won't like. In particular, right, like here we have to regularize in weird ways to handle the, the minimax stuff. And like we're finding a saddle. So all the standard Armijo line search stuff won't work on this, right? So you actually need sort of a custom solver for this stuff, which is partly why I'm writing it out in the DDP context, not the direct, you know, kind of, kind of context. It's a weird problem. Uh, okay, what was I doing before I got distracted? Uh, okay, yeah, so you have this thing. It looks like LQR, but with a bunch of little tweaks, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then you also get, um, sort of weirdly, you also get a delta W. So like W, there's a symmetry here, right? Like W is also a player that's like doing control, um, that you're kind of like fighting. And so we'll write this guy out too. This, this is a whole new thing, right? So W same way has a feed forward and a feedback term. And um, you don't get this at all in, in LQR. This, I guess, I don't know how to think about this other than it's like, this is how the math works out. And you have to like keep track of the, you're also optimizing something for the W player. So you get like a corresponding sort of um, symmetric looking, and I'll try to write better, by the way, uh, sort of feedback thing, feed forward feedback thing for this player, where you get a feed forward and a feedback gain matrix. Let's see, is there anything else fun to talk about here? Uh, I think there might be. So does anyone recognize these like sandwichy matrix things going on, like the red underlined terms? Or yeah, similarly down here where you can maybe read it better because I wrote slower. Does anyone recognize that thing? Like the thing in the parentheses basically is actually a thing you might've seen before, especially if you're in my lab. I heard of. No, it's something called a sure compliment. Has anyone heard of a sure compliment? Have we talked about that in here? Probably not. I don't know. Fun fact. Uh, weirdly, all, those show up all over the place. It's also how you marginalize a Gaussian distribution. Uh, I don't know. It's a thing. Maybe, maybe if no one's heard about it, then maybe, maybe it's not a thing. <laughs> okay. So then, um, you know, the, the gist of, the, just to finish off the algorithm, the idea, right? So we, we've got these delta U, delta W things. Um, we can plug delta U and delta W back into S just like before, right? Uh, with standard DDP to get the, the new cost to go or value function. What else is there to say about this? Yeah, I mean, so we can do that, I guess. It's not particularly interesting. So you'd get like the little p and then the big p hessian and you can write out what those things look like if you care so once again it's like an lqr like term and then a new robustifying w term same thing here. And interestingly, if we look at this, uh, I guess I'll write it first before I say anything. Sorry. Can you can we say anything about what the um, the U and X W players are doing to the cost from this? Not really, maybe. So like the W player, if this guy's negative definite is always making the cost worse, basically, right? Uh, okay, so the rest of this looks exactly the same as standard EDP. So I don't think it's like super worth, uh, you know, belaboring that.
Okay, uh, what else should we say about this? Yeah, I don't think we need to write that stuff out. Um, yeah, so the, the biggest, so practical stuff, if you go try to code this up, the biggest difference uh, versus standard DDP is that um, the action value Hessian is now quasi definite, just like the KKT stuff we talked about before, where it's going to have some strictly positive eigenvalues associated with the min and some strictly negative eigenvalues associated with the max for that saddle point structure, right? So it should have how many positive ones? Like dimension X plus dimension U, right? And then dimension W negative eigenvalues. Um, yeah, so you've got to sort of like, when you write down the cost function for this thing, um, you've got to write it down such that basically if you write down a quadratic cost for like, you know, X, U, W, the quadratic cost term corresponding to the W has to have a negative definite sort of Hessian, which is a little weird. So I'll write this down and we can talk about it a sec. Let's see. So cost function might look like um, like your standard sort of X transpose QX thing, U transpose RU. And then a um, a W term, which which should I use? Let's go with I don't know from yesterday. Maybe we can use a capital W. I'm out of ideas. And then you know maybe terminal cost. So you'd have here Q, Q N, and R positive definite. And then you'd want this W to be negative definite. So similarly, if I need to regularize this thing, which I typically would, right? Um, you'd want to do something like we talked about before with the KKT stuff, where you'd do like a alpha i minus alpha i. So you want to push the positive ones more positive, the negative ones more negative, and, and keep the eigenvalue spectrum kind of the right way. And then looking at this thing, um, what should I do if I want to um, make the system more robust? Like what, um, what here in this setup corresponds to like, you know, making the system super robust. So super robust means large Ws, right? How do I encourage large W's in this setup? Lower cost for W, right? So I make like norm of that big W Hessian small, right? So low penalty on the W's, right? And then similarly, if I make that have a large norm, penalizes these guys. 
then I get uh, less robust behavior. And then, so, okay, so is there like, what's the limit where I'd recover sort of standard LQR with this setup? Positive infinity or negative infinity? Right, yeah. Okay, oh, sorry, not LQR, but DDP in this case, right? So yeah, this is a little weird and maybe not. So this, this Minimax DEP thing, the, this is basically what's in that original paper. In that paper, they're doing vanilla DDP with no constraints. So this cost thing is basically all you can do. Uh, so it's a bit weird to like think about what that, uh, that cost weight associated with the disturbance should be. And that's not typically how we like to think about this. A more standard robust control kind of approach, if you kind of read about this stuff more, is usually to, um, uh, put a constraint on the W. So it's like bounded norm or from some set or something like that. So um, I don't know if anyone's done this. Actually, if no one's done this, we should probably do it. <laughs> uh, so like this minimax DEP thing with constraints such that you could actually put like a, you know, draw W from a, a ball or a box or something like this and have it actually correspond to system parameters. You could say like, you know, I don't know, the mass is bounded plus or minus 10% like whatever other parameters of the robot, the wind gusts are bounded plus or minus whatever, stick that in there and then solve this problem, right? And then it has some physical meaning. So I'd say like my main criticism of this paper and this existing setup is that it doesn't really, like this soft cost on W thing doesn't really give you the ability to like give those kind of guarantees on, on meaningful system parameters. You're kind of like throwing this in there and seeing what comes out. And like in general, it will be more robust than the nominal case. And yeah, basically, I think that's sort of uh, sort of it. So um, this is the I'll send this out to you guys. But yeah, this is kind of cool. They, they when they originally did this, they did this on this legged robot, this walker, and like you know got it to walk farther than the best hand tuned controller, and better than kind of the standard DEP stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I think they have some stuff, some language in here about the tuning. But I think I mostly did this because it it's similar to the stuff we've done before, and so it's like easy to kind of write it down. I'd say this isn't that common though in the robust control world. Like they typically do this stuff with bounds and it's usually about that H infinity linear robust control stuff. Uh, yeah, okay. I think that's actually about all I want to talk about today. And unfortunately I did not code this up and I don't have a cool software demo for you because I ran out of time and went to sleep. So uh, maybe next year, or maybe I'll get super motivated tonight and do it. <laughs> Or maybe one of you got super motivated to do it. So just a quick question. Why is it that W is going to be minus Yeah, so it's got to be negative definite, as we said, for it to have a saddle equilibrium point, right? So if it weren't negative definite, remember you're maximizing, right? So if it's positive definite, then what that's saying is I can make that go to infinity, you know, arbitrarily positive, right? So that's why it has to be negative definite. It's basically saying that you have a saddle point, like that there is a peak, right? Otherwise, you drive it to infinity. So that's why it has to be that way. And then the idea is if I make it super, super big, what it's doing is penalizing large W's, right? And um, in the infinite limit, you're like penalizing the W's effectively down to zero. So that they, you have no disturbance, right? That makes sense? Cool. All right. I think that's, that's about it. <laughs>